The next drug we shall be talking about is warfarin. Now, warfarin is different from heparin. Before we start about talking about warfarin, let's take a look at the clotting cascade because this is where warfarin gets its bread and butter and that's where it does its job. As you can see here, I told you there's an extrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway is very short, all right? It basically takes tissue factor and we have factor seven and factor seven eventually is converted to factor 10 and 10A eventually converts to factor two, which is goes to 2A and then we form fibrinogen to fibrin. Now, warfarin has an effect on certain coagulation factors. And these coagulation factors are factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. So let's circle those. So we have factor two, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. Now, before we actually move on, how are these factors actually activated in the body? That is definitely worth talking about because they require vitamin K, all right? So vitamin K is normally in an oxidized form. Oxidized vitamin K. Now, before we move on, I have to tell you where all these coagulation factors are coming from. Cause they're just not dropping from the sky, they're made in our body. It's made in the liver, all right? All coagulation factors are made in the liver except factor eight. So on the boards, if they wanna get you, they will ask you that which of the following cofactors is not made in the liver and it's factor eight. Because factor eight is married to a von Willebrand factor, that's why. All right, that's another board hint you need to know. So oxidized vitamin K is actually converted and activated into reduced form by epoxide reductase. Epoxide reductase. And then we have a reduced form of vitamin K. Vitamin K. Now this vitamin K is not gonna act as a cofactor, right? There's a factor, and hey, somebody try to cofactor, it's like co-founder. All right, it's a cofactor that now take the precursors of factor two, factor seven, factor nine, factor 10. Oh, there's more, protein C and S, all right? So it's gonna take them, so we have factor two, factor seven, nine, 10, factor C and S. And it's not gonna activate them, all right? It's gonna act as a cofactor and then activate this into their regular cofactors. And that's how those cofactors are actually activated. They become more mature. Now, where warfarin kicks in is warfarin is going to inhibit hypoxide reductase. Warfarin inhibits hypoxide reductase. And when warfarin inhibits that, we, cannot, we don't have a reduced form of vitamin K to act as a cofactor to convert these immature cofactors into mature cofactors, which means if we don't have factor seven, factor nine, factor 10, and factor two, the extrinsic pathway is not going to function. Although factor nine is not part of the extrinsic pathway, but as you can see, factor seven, factor 10, and factor two are all in, in part of the cofactors in the extrinsic pathway. And the way I always remember this is because I draw a line here, and it's actually not a line, it's gonna be a gun, all right? Because the extrinsic, the ex-president of the United States, extrinsic factors, is gonna declare a war. And because the extrinsic pathway is where all those warfarin, oh, the ex-president just declared a war, yeah, because there's warfarin that's gonna be inhibit factor seven, 9, 10, 
and factor two. So the way I also remember these cofactors forever and ever is vitamin K was born in 1972. All right, so this is 1972 with protein C and S obviously, which you gotta remember. But remember, factor one is actually not what exists, it's actually factor 10. Factor 10, that's, it's, so it's like a misnomer. But if I say 1972, it's so easier for me to remember because I always put it, I can say, okay, 972, 10. Okay, so it's 1972, all right? So, as you can see here, this is how warfarin causes anticoagulation. So the blood is now well anticoagulated and the blood is thin. Because if we can't make all these cofactors to make fibrinogen, we can't make fibrin, we can't even, we can make all these platelets, but they are very fragile and unstable, they're gonna fall apart, and the patient is going to bleed a lot, okay? So that is how warfarin works. Now, another thing I have to actually emphasize is that it also interferes with the normal synthesis and gamma carboxylation of this vitamin K cofactor. So what does that mean? Remember I told you that's as a cofactor? The, the mechanism by which these cofactors are activated is known as gamma carboxylation, which means the addition of a carboxyl group, okay? And if you wanna go a little bit into biochemistry, this is what a carboxyl group looks like, all right? And let's say this is a cofactor, factor two. And when this gamma carboxylation to the cofactor is activated, that's how they become mature, okay? Now, also, another mechanism that you have to remember is that this is all also happening in the cytochrome P450 pathway. This is met this metabolism also occur with the cytochrome P450. Now, how do you remember what do we use to measure the rate of anticoagulation of warfarin, okay? Well, we check the PT, okay? Prothrombin time is what we measure, which is also known as PT, or the international ratio, INR, so in order to monitor how well a patient is well anticoagulated in medicine, you wanna check the PT or INR, and basically they are the same. The reason we came up with INR is because we had PTT, which is a three letter word, and wouldn't it be nice to have a three letter word for PT also, and that's where we had INR, okay? Now, the INR for the patient has to be between two and three, for them to be well anticoagulated, okay? So that's the number you wanna look for when a patient is well anticoagulated on warfarin. Now, another key important thing you need to know is that warfarin has a long half-life. It has a long half-life. So I've been saying warfarin, but it has another name known as coumadin, all right? So patients probably don't know like, oh, they're taking warfarin, but, they might call it coumadin. That's another name for warfarin. That is the brand name for warfarin. So what do we use warfarin for? What is the clinical use of warfarin? Well, it makes sense. We're trying to thin out the blood so they don't clot. So we're gonna use it for symptoms that cause clotting in the body. Well, the first one is we use it after an ST elevation myocardial infarction, okay? which is known as STEMI. So we use for chronic anticoagulation. In a patient that has ST elevation myocardial infarction, right? So a patient came in and you see this on the EKG. And you're like, oh my God, you're having a myocardial infarction. Look at that ST elevation myocardial infarction. After you're done treating the patient, they have to be on coumadin. Also, we use for DVT prophylaxis. DVT prophylaxis. 
deep venous thrombosis prophylaxis. So if a patient has a DVT, you put them on warfarin. Why? Because when their blood is not thin, that clot is going to go and form a pulmonary embolism. So when you put them on Coumadin, the patient will have a thinner blood and they'll have less likelihood of developing a pulmonary embolism. It's also used for protection and prevention of a stroke in a patient with atrial fibrillation. Okay, prevention of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Now let's talk a little bit about that because this is actually very important for the boards. So patients that have atrial fibrillation, what happens? They have a heart, okay? That's their heart. And this is their atrium. This is their ventricle. And their atrium is quivering. And when their atrium quivers, it causes stasis of blood. Okay, blood starts to stay inside the atrium. Well, that can be a problem because if blood starts to stay, you can form a clot inside your atrium. When the patients form a clot inside the atrium, that is a bad problem because when this clot breaks off, it's going to go into the left ventricle and bam, it's going to go right into the aorta, right? So it's going to go into the aorta and there's a couple of things that can happen. The clot can travel a couple of directions. It can go straight into the common carotid artery and when it gets into the common carotid artery, it's going to go into the brain, okay? When the clot goes into a blood vessel in the brain, it's going to clog up the smaller blood vessel and call it ischemia, and the patient is going to develop acute ischemic stroke, and they might just have a facial droop, slurred speech, you know, arm paralysis, hemiplegia, all right? That is a stroke from a clot that came from the heart. That is bad. In order to prevent that, you put the patient on coumadin or warfarin, Thins the blood, it prevents the clot from forming so the patient does not develop an acute ischemic stroke. Also, you, patients can develop mesenteric ischemia. Remember, this clot can travel down the aorta also and go down. It can either branch into the renal artery, causes renal artery ischemia, or the, the, there's the celiac trunk, the SMA, and then the inferior mesenteric artery. If it goes in and blocks off the superior mesenteric artery, the patient is going to develop mesenteric ischemia, which is going to cause dead gut, and the bowel is going to infarct and die. That's bad. So there's so many things, reason why putting patients on Coumadin is going to save their lives, prevent them from developing acute ischemic stroke, especially if they have a history of atrial fibrillation. Now, we cannot give Coumadin for pregnant patients. It's a teratogen. Oops. All right. So the reason is because warfarin can cross the placenta compared to heparin. Heparin does not cross the placenta. So that's a big difference between both of them. So in a pregnant female that develop a DVT, okay, uh, or develop a pulmonary embolism, you can put them a heparin, but you cannot give them Coumadin. And we always monitor the PT and INR values in patients that have uh, taken warfarin. So what are the complications of taking this drug? Okay, as great as a drug it is that saves lives, it also has complication. So the toxicity obviously is going to be bleeding because patients blood are very, very thin. It's also a teratogen because it can cross the placenta and damage the baby. You don't want to do that. And it can cause warfarin induced skin necrosis. Necrosis. So this is always a classic board question they love to test. They might show you a picture of a female and you see like their arm is just black or the entire side is just black. And you said, but the rest of the skin is still intact, but you see just a huge patch of blackness. And they said the patient, you know, has a history of DVT, you know, was recently admitted to the hospital and started on a medication. What drug must have predisposed the patient to this? This is warfarin-induced skin necrosis. Make sure you remember that for the boards. Don't let them get you because warfarin can cause skin breakdown and death of the skin tissues. And when you see that, 
that is warfarin induced skin or tissue necrosis now also warfarin gets to interact with so many drugs it has a lot of drug interactions so that's another issue with the drug also now they are gonna test you on warfarin toxicity you bet you they're gonna test you on it they love it because these are drugs that can be reversible all right so if there's ever an overdose of warfarin the treatment is vitamin k okay overdose treatment you give vitamin k and fresh frozen plasma okay so for a rapid reversal you give the patient fresh frozen plasma so whenever so let me give you an example so this actually makes sense so let's say a patient came to the hospital and their uh, INR is 5. That's not good. That's high. Normally, if their INR is just elevated and they're not bleeding, if you just want to reverse them, you can, but usually you tell the patient to skip their dose of warfarin and you recheck their INR levels. And if it comes out to about a 2 or 3, you're like, okay, you can restart it back or they decrease the dose. Now, on the boards, what we want you to know is how do you reverse the medication if a patient is bleeding from a warfarin toxicity or overdose because the patient can bleed to death really quickly, develop hemorrhagic shock and bleed to death. So you give them vitamin K. Let's take a look at why we give them vitamin K. Well, if you give them vitamin K, normally it, 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 it inhibits this epoxide reductase, reductase, but if you give them enough vitamin K, you're gonna be able to ha allow it to act as a cofactor. And also you give Fresh frozen plasma. Fresh frozen plasma actually contains factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. That's fresh frozen plasma. So you're giving them those coagulation factors that's actually missing in the first place so that you can replace those and the patient can form a clot because once you put them back into place, the machine starts to run, you make thrombin, you make fibrinogen and fibrin, and the patient stops bleeding. So do not forget that. Vitamin K and fresh frozen plasma as a drug of choice to reverse warfarin. And that basically brings us to the end of our lecture on warfarin.